Okay, we might make a start. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Anthony Murphy, the CEO of Lucerne Investment Partners, and i um, proud to be here today. And uh, joining us, we have Martin Dalgleish and Martin Robinson, uh, founders of Hill Partners. Uh, some of you in the audience today will already be familiar with Hill and, and some may be seeing the story for the first time. Um, Lucerne and its investors decided to invest in Hill about three to four months ago. Um, after doing our due diligence on the, the fund itself and speaking with, with Martin and his, um, and, and his team at the time. Um, we're super excited about this investment and how it's been performing of late. Um, and we're super excited about the future as well, particularly around the dialogue we've been having um, with the team at Hill of late. Um, I won't steal any of the guys' thunder though and let them take you through that. But I just uh, thought it'd be best first and foremost to... Um, just to get a little bit of background on Hill again and an introduction from both Martin and Martin about their backgrounds as well. We've got the double Martin team today. And, um, and then we'll, we'll dive into the portfolio itself, where it's standing at the moment, um, and talk about some investments that are on the horizon the guys have been um, uh, looking out of late. And then we'll talk about where the fund's up to and where it's potentially looking to, to hard close um, in the near term. Um, as usual, just for housekeeping, if you had any questions along the way, please use the function at the bottom of your screen to, to raise your hand and, um, and we'll answer those questions in due course as well. Uh, but I might hand it over to Martin Robinson first to, to kick things off. And again, thanks for everybody for attending today. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. And thanks everyone for, for joining. Uh, for those that I didn't have a chance to uh, speak to last time, my name is Martin Robinson, one of the uh, founding partners of Heal. Um, just by way of background, um, you know, I suppose I grew up in, in Australia many moons ago, commenced my, my career as a, uh, a lawyer with Allens and then linked later in London and Hong Kong um, before moving across to Macquarie Capital, where I was um, in the principal investment team, investing the bank's money um, out of Hong Kong across, uh, across Asia and a range of sectors. Um, and prior to moving back to Australia <clears throat> in the last year or so, I spent um, the previous 10 years in Singapore working for one of the biggest family offices there, running their private equity healthcare strategy. Um, I was chairman of uh, Vietnam's um, largest private hospital group, uh, was on the board of Halidoc, which is Indonesia's uh, largest telemedicine drug delivery platform, for example, um, before moving back to Australia to, to launch Heal last year. Um, and before I sort of go into a bit of a recap on the, the Hill story and the portfolio and where things are at, I'll just pass to Martin Dalgleish um, to give you his background. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Another Martin uh, makes it a bit simpler um, to Martins. Um, my background, uh, really 40 years in the technology uh, space, primarily IBM initially, uh, a lot of time in the UK. I uh, was the managing director of Optus Consumer back in the early 2000s, running um, their telephony business, their internet business, and their pay TV business. Uh, then I joined the Packers and worked at PBL for five years on the boards of a lot of media companies you would have heard of, PBL Media, Foxtel, Fox Sports, Seat, Car Sales, Sky News, Ticket Tech Hoyts, Raft of others. So cut my teeth there, did quite a bit of m and in the technology, digital space, I'm a partner in, um, Hill Partners, obviously a partner in a, a, my own company, Asia Principal Capital, uh, which one of the general partners of Hill, and sort of a specialist in the, um, in the digital technology disruption thematic. I'm also an independent director on the board of KPMG Australia, uh, and uh, chairman of a number of portfolio companies uh, that are all technology um, and disruptors. Thanks, Martin. Um, so for those uh, new to the story, uh, HEAL, the acronym being Health, Education and Lifestyle, we are a, a growth stage fund, so we are scale up, not start up. Um, if you look at our existing portfolio, um, at the bottom end of the run rate revenues, it's at 20 million, at the upper end it's $120 million of run rate revenue. So that gives you a sense of the sort of maturity and depth and, and breadth of the businesses that we're investing in. So they're proven business models, um, generating revenue in a high growth stage, um, not VC. So these businesses are deep risk, but in a high growth stage. Um, the target IRR of, of the fund is, is a 30% uh, per annum IRR. Um, what we're really looking to achieve for our investors is a money on money multiple over a three, four, five year period of three, four, five times people's money. Um, we've, we launched last year and um, you know, so far we've been very pleased with the performance and feel like we are, we are on track, albeit uh, very early days. Um, I suppose the genesis for me really um, in Heal 
goes back to a, um, an investment into Dental Corp that I led a $100 million round back in 2011. And uh, Dental Corp was one of the more successful roll-ups in Australian healthcare history. Uh, and that business was founded by Mark Evans and Chris Chambers, you know, Melbourne-based, um, and advised by Peter Chapman. And um, so, and today, the four of us, uh, four of the five members of the investment committee, to, uh, together with Martin uh, Dale Gleish. And that the Dental Corp story was, um, you know, really, I suppose, the, the background to founding and building that business is really part of the DNA of Heal. It was uh, really partnering with the dentists uh, where we aligned and engaged their interests with uh, material equity participation in that business. Um, they went from zero to 200 facilities over a, a six year period in Australia and New Zealand, and it was sold for $640 million. Um, uh, dollars and separately uh, uh, went and co-founded the same business in Canada with the local partner there, um, and Dr. Andrew Meikle, who is today the founder of our IVF business, um, and that was even a you know, great success story there with, um, I think, the exit after one, uh, of $1.7 billion after about seven years. And so, you know, you'll see from the team, uh, very much a team of operators and business builders, and that really informs that sort of active management and partnership type of approach that we look to bring to the businesses that we either found ourselves or the management teams that we um, we work with. Um, so we launched last year, we launched with uh, three seed assets on day one, uh, about a year ago. Um, and those three seed assets were actually um, previously founded by members of the, of the HEAL team. Um, and that was Edge Early Learning, the childcare gr group in, here in, uh, in Queensland, founded by Mark Evans, uh, Chris Chambers and Peter, Peter Chapman. Mark had previously founded and successfully sold Kids Campus and, and um, has a lot of experience in that sector. Um, the second seed asset was um, what is today the world's largest tattoo removal business. Um, and the third seed asset is um, today's Canada's largest IVF group, um, which, as I mentioned, was you know, founded by Dr. Andrew Meikle, one of our advisory committee um, members and long term term partners. Um, you know, since we launched, uh, we've done two sort of third party investments. One is Higher Ground, the largest Montessori school group. Uh, in the US and the other one, um, the recent one is Crimson Education, which Martin Dalglish led. And we'll um, talk about some of those details in uh, uh, later on in the call today. Um, so we've been very pleased with the reception that we've had uh, today from investors. We, um, we targeted um, to raise $100 million with the right to take overs on day one. This time last year, we got to $90 million on first close. So well ahead of our expectations. Um, and now we're coming up to second close, um, which we're, I think now we've scheduled for the for the end of September. Um, we've got two new exciting deals that will be announced prior to them and one material follow on opportunity. Um, looks like it's taken us a while to secure. I think we talked about last time and we'll go into more detail about that. But, um, you know, by second close, um, we will have seven investments. We will have um, invested 70 million of the $90 million uh, raised to date. Um, and then really looking to raise another 30 or $40 million in the fund uh, to close the fund out. Um, and, and that capital will really be um, predominantly used just to go in as follow on capital into the existing uh, portfolio that we have. So we'll have seven by second close. We may do one more. We may rule the line between, um, over the portfolio at that stage. So essentially the opportunity for investors looking to either um, you know, continue their participation or top up or new investors is to come into a, you know, a, a strongly performing portfolio a portfolio that is de-risked, is mature, a large amount of the, the capital is being deployed and there's a high degree of visibility um, in terms of, uh, you know, where the, where your money will be um, will be invested. Um, uh, and just on that, what's the, 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 the driver behind, I guess, supporting on follow-on rounds into the existing, or what will be existing seven investments as opposed to looking at new opportunities? Um, you know, I, I think that and, and the, uh, first and foremost, we want to be a very focused and disciplined in terms of our approach. Um, and don't want to try to do too much. Um, we're obviously, you know, very happy with the portfolio that we've created to date, have a lot of visibility over their capital requirements going forward. You know, three of those businesses, um, the three seed assets I mentioned, we effectively have negative control of them and a high level of influence. And so from our perspective, in terms of that risk reward equation, um, it going to these growth capital businesses, you know, we feel that that's the best return for our money um, and in, in order to achieve that 30% net IRR. Sure, thank you. Um, so I suppose if I just, um, you know, just touch on, you know, where some of the assets are at um, before Martin will sort of, you know, dive into the Crimson opportunity. So as I mentioned, uh, Edge Early Learning Centres um, is, uh, you know, is based, South East Queensland based. We currently have 21 facilities open, another uh, 10, I think, in development, various stages of construction. 
um, we've got a, a large pipeline um, that gives us line of sight to get to over 50 centres in the next two or three years. Um, the business has been performing very well. Um, we are now highly likely, and I think we mentioned this last time, we've uh, got a handshake deal to now move to a term sheet um, on a, a material follow-on investment, which will see us putting another $25 million into that business. Um, that is a 100% markup, um, and, and there's other people coming into that, that particular deal, so third parties um, as well, but um, that deal is a 100% markup to where we invested uh, this time last year. And the reason for that size of that markup is we picked up shares from a distressed seller at that time. So we picked up shares of what we considered to be half price at that time. And so the new price, um, we still believe represents very good value and, and buying opportunity and is, um, definitely meets our sort of um, return thresholds uh, sort of going forward over the next you know, three to four year period. Um, we are looking to replicate that model um, in other states at the moment, and, um, and and there's also a number of acquisitions of you know uh, cent or groups which have between five and ten uh, childcare centres that we're potentially looking to supplement the greenfield growth strategy um, for that business to really accelerate that growth profile. So um, and then on removery, um, the business just continues. just on edge there, Martin. What's what's the end game for edge? Do you see? Yeah, look, so we've obviously, we've seen quite a bit of consolidation in the market recently. So there was a recent transaction with um, sort of Quadrant and Affinity. Um, mm -hmm. We saw the sort of Asian bidder with Busy Bees um, and we expect to see more consolidation, you know, over time. So, um, you know, our our best sort of guidance on, on that business or, or feeling is that's probably a trade sale, whether it's to private equity or to a strategic in sort of three to four years time. Um, yeah, for that particular that opportunity. Thanks. So uh, removery, the the, um, the world's largest tattoo removal business, um, you know, continues to exceed our expectation. Um, you know, revenues continue to um, you know sort of have record months, and our base case assumptions of you know what we thought would be the steady state revenue uh, for each clinic has 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 probably gone up by thirty or forty percent given the performance that we're seeing. We're now at fifty eight centres. I think we've got about four in Canada, um, two or three now in Australia. Um, and the rest in the US, and we've got a pipeline to get to about 85 or 95, um, potentially even 100 by year end. So again, the one that we're you know, really excited about in terms of that sort of just global remit, uh, global opportunity for that business, um, you know, with a, the only player in the whole world of any scale, um, sitting on you know, $40 million of cash to really finance those growth plans over time. I think we've done something like 300,000 laser removals um, which, you know, for, to the next competitor of which there's nothing of scale is, you know, would they sort of pale into its significance. And so it's that, that level of that sort of quality, the know-how um, that's really, you know, sort of positions us to be that trusted and reputable provider for tattoo removal um, sort of going forward. Um, you know, as I think we talked about previously, um, we raised 50 million US from Elliott back in January, which was a 24% markup from where we invested in September last year. And given the performance of the business, we certainly feel that um, you know, the valuation of that business continues to, to move forward. Um, so on IVF, um, you know, again, as I said, uh, founded by um, you know, Andrew Meekall and Peter Chapman and Mark Edmonds were in, uh, instrumental in the founding of that business as well. Um, that business you know, launched last year, uh, have done a number of acquisitions recently. Really, it really uses the same dental corp partnership model that um, we use successfully in Dental Corp Canada. Um, and uh, that business today in less than a year is at 20 to 25% market share uh, and growing very nicely. Um, we recently took, um, they recently raised $15 million. Uh, we've got sort of enlarged follow-on rights into that business. And so we took um, about 20 to 25% of that, um, of that round, just under $4 million. And we're looking to continue to build our uh, position in that business. Um, you know, that business is now starting to look at other geographies, including the US in terms of its expansion um, strategy. Um, so again, in a, from a valuation creation perspective, we're certainly, um, you know, looking very positive as well. Um, and on those initial three businesses, where are you seeing most growth? Is it, is it M&A or is it organic or combination of both? Yeah, look, it's, 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 it's a combination of both. I mean, on remover, if Tata remover, for, for example, it's that we've actually had more acquisitions than we pre previously thought, um, uh, which is you know, not a bad thing. Um, I think, you know, people are seeing now seeing the industry as an attractive place to do, uh, to, 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 to commence operations. And so we've seen small groups of two or three or four um, emerging. And so when they do, you know, we're basically looking to buy them out and, um, and bring them into the group. And so that, so that, um, 
that strategy has served us well. Um, but I think from here, it's really predominantly a greenfield strategy, um, you know, opening up and shopping centres and things like that that we've, we've talked about previously. Sure. Um, I think that the fourth asset is, is high ground, which is the, the US's largest Montessori school group. Um, you know, you know, a very strong growth trajectory on that business, over $100 million of run rate revenue. Um, uh, it's coming up to another round very shortly. I think, you know, again, we talked about previously, we invested in December last year. Um, and three months later, they went to a second raising of $30 million at a 49% markup to where we invested originally. Um, the, the round coming up at the end of this year looks to be at a material premium to that valuation as well. And so, again, from a sort of value creation and portfolio performance uh, perspective, um, you know, we're, we're very happy with how, how that's shaping up. Um, so I might pass to Martin Douglas here just to uh, deep dive into our latest investment, Crimson Education. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Um... So Crimson, Crimson's a really interesting story. It, it's a New Zealand company, um, and it's one that not many people in Australia would have heard of, and that's because it was effectively closed out to Australian investors because it didn't need to be. Um, they are a college admission consulting business, and I'll explain it in a minute, but probably the more pertinent point is that their founder is 26 years of age. It's probably the most extraordinary individual we've ever met. Um, give you an idea uh, as a high achieving individual that he is. He's got a degree from Harvard, a degree from Stanford, and a degree from Oxford, and he's a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, whilst he was undertaking his education, he was also working for Tiger Global, uh, who, of course, are probably the preeminent hedge fund in the world as an analyst. Um, and we spoke to um, one of the Tiger Global principals who said, we hire the brightest and best, and he's the most intelligent person we've ever come across. And in doing that, they backed him. Uh, and they backed him quite materially, both at a corporate level and a funnel level, but also the Julian Robertson and Alex Robertson and Chase Coleman, who are the three kind of luminaries of Tiger globally. Some of you may have heard of them, have all been um, a, a material a PA backers in Crimson Education. Crimson, um, five-year-old company in effect, doing revenues now kind of circa north of 50 million US, helping really bright kids get established and ready to uh, ultimately get placements in Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, Yale, et cetera, all the Ivy League schools and all the um, Oxford and Cambridge in the UK. And, and doing that with a uh, degree of success over the years, you know, with an average sort of revenue of circa 20,000 US per student and scaling beautifully. But what really excited us by that opportunity is we got to know Crimson and we're leveraging to try and get a seat at the table, was that they've also established um, what is probably now the second largest international pure online high school. And that is a school that is accredited for both UK A-levels and US um, Ivy League placement um, uh, credentials, uh, effectively operating out of New Zealand, but it's online. So its students are all over the world. Um, we got to know them back in December last year, they had about 90 students and they're really only just building that business. Fast forward to today, they've got about 450, should be 550 by the end of next month, 1,000 by the end of this year. Uh, all paying, uh, pardon me, an average of about 15,000 US per student and typically doing traditional bricks and mortar high school, but complementing that with accelerated subjects using Crimson Global Academy, math, science, economics, but also new subjects that aren't taught at bricks and mortar schools, AI, law, robotics, for example and um, no geographic boundaries. Um, growing beautifully, massive uh, total addressable market opportunity. Jamie Beaton, the founder, surrounded himself not only with the Tiger Global guys, uh, recently you might have seen the AFR this week, uh, Kevin Rudd has joined as an advisor, John Key, the ex-New Zealand Prime Minister, as an advisor, Larry Summers, the ex-US Treasury head, is an advisor. And what actually helped us get in the door and we were the only Australian um, investor to, to get access to that opportunity. And we led a, a small little round uh, that closed about a month ago, um, is that also one of our investors and one of our advisors is a guy called Rod Jones, who's the founder of Navitas, uh, which obviously is the um, private equity backed uh, private college uh, business out of Perth. Rod is a doyen of the industry. And we introduced Rod early in our diligencing uh, to Jamie and um, there was an immediate rapport there and, and indeed we'll sort of build off that as time comes. So we were very fortunate to be offered the lead role in a small little tucking round. We were delighted to take it. 
We've only got about a 1% position in Crimson, so it's not a big material control position, but I've got a very close here with Jamie. Uh, there will be a large Series D round coming up in early uh, 2022. That's probably going to be a 50 million US dollar plus round. And I think we'd be well positioned to take a, a decent piece of that pending um, diligencing at the time. But certainly very excited by the opportunity, terrific business in our region, uh, and one that is a true disruptor in, in the education space. And Martin Hodge Jones is taking on a, a mentoring role with um, with J Jamie as well. Yeah, that's right. So uh, Rod Rod will uh, formalise um, that arrangement, and and Rob's delighted. Rod's I, you, a lot of you here wouldn't know Rod. He's in his sixties. He's just a, a perfect gentleman, um, but absolutely regarded internationally in the education space. And you know, when when he saw the opportunity to learn from a Jamie, a twenty six year old, but at the same time you know, help impart some of his wisdom and sage advice. Um, he was delighted to do that. Jamie was delighted to take it. And that really kind of galvanized um, uh, Heel Partners and, and Crimson together. And and um, here we are. So we're, I, I think we're, we're really pleased about being able to get access to that opportunity. And what would the, roughly the size of the check you'd be looking to write in? in early uh, well, we, we, we led the round uh, yeah, with a 5 million US check. Yep. Um, we, we've just got a small opportunity now to just quickly top that up. So it's something that we might do in the next the next few weeks uh, with probably another uh, one or two million. Uh, and so our position there is going to be between one, 1 1.2 and 1.5% of the company. So, you know, material, the company's got material revenues, right, and, and material growth. So we, we think, by the way, that company will end up uh, more than likely listing on NASDAQ in the next two or three years and, and would be a prized asset, particularly with its register. You know, when... Julian Robertson takes a material PA position in a company. People, people take notice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in terms of if you looked at the portfolio as a whole, and you guys might have different opinion, but what would be the asset you're most excited about at this stage? I mean, you're excited about all of them, but what's the one you're most excited about? And we'll ask you that question again in 12 months. So I'll, I'll have first go there, Martin. And, and, <laughs> and you know, um, so, I mean, they're all, I mean, honestly, we, if we're not excited by all of them, we shouldn't be doing them, right? So the, the starting exactly. point is we're not, we're, not, we're not sort of set and forget passive, um, low conviction investors. We're, we're high conviction investors. So, you know, we, we run our, our modeling, um, we take the management forecast, we typically bring them right down and reset our own base cases. And, and we look to make sure that we feel we can achieve those IRRs. And if you're getting a 30% IRR in a portfolio company over, say, a five-year five-year term, you know, you're generating material growth, right? So you should be excited by that because, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to disrupt, right? This, this is, these, these are businesses that are in their own way disrupting material large market opportunities. There's no doubt, right? If, if, if you say, what's my favorite, to be frank, the one that creates dinner party conversation, tattoo removal, right? Because that's the best idea that everyone's thought of but never did. Um, I've had that conversation 20 times. Oh, I thought of that. Well, yeah, but you didn't do it, right? So... <laughs> we, we done it right so so that's a good thing and and, and the beautiful thing about tattoo and, and to sort of compliment martin's commentary earlier on is it doesn't matter if the tattoo market the tattoo market not the tattoo removal market if the tattoo market continues to grow and it's become pretty fashionable um, some of you on this call probably have some i no doubt right but the more tattoos the more likely people will look to remove them at some point in time not just to get rid of them more about half people who remove tattoos by the way to go over the top again with yeah. more and different art. So if the tattoo market grows, we will grow with it. If the tattoo market becomes unfashionable and declines, the tattoo removal market will also grow. It'll go contrary because more people will want to get rid of them if tattoos suddenly are unfashionable. So we're actually leveraged to both trends, which is really unusual. So we like that as a, a business. It's absolute Greenfield's opportunity um, we, that could be a massive uh, business in years to come. And, you know, 57 centers or 58 Martin that you covered off earlier on, you know, will grow materially from that base. And I think it, it, it'll be a huge company. Yeah, I think one of the stats in your recent report last week was what 150, I'm just reading it here, 150 million Americans have tattoos and 50 of them, 50 million of them admit to regret, while at least 30 million seek fading and removal. So one in three people regret the tattoo they get, but then they either go back and, get their new lover's name over the top or um, or um, or an update? You know, ten, 10 years ago, tattoo art was monochrome and reasonably dull, right, for want of a better word. Now, I mean, you've all seen footballers with arm sleeves with 
15 colors of the rainbow and beautiful artistry, right? So the artistry has moved. Mm -hmm. So if people want to keep up with the trend, they want to go over the top mm -hmm. and redo. So we're happy to help them. What's your favorite, Martin R? Oh, look, I, I probably, you know, can't disagree with that one too, too much either. Um, but I, you know, I think, you know, our seed assets, you know, for us to have that sort of um, outsized influence through the shareholdings with the founders, our associates, et cetera, and essentially negative control, you know, each of those three seed assets, you know, for me are just, you know, we know them intimately. We're involved in the data they business. We effectively control them. And so, they're, you know, we know what, what risks there are, if any, and we can be ahead of the curve. And, uh, you know, we, we can see the growth opportunity there. So, you know, IVF for me, you know, you're buying, for, you're buying centers at seven times. And um, our base case exit, you know, for a scale platform is anywhere between 14 and 16 times. So a huge multiple arbitrage opportunity just before you get even get into operational synergies and things like that. And then Edge, you know, I think, you know, childcare um, continues to grow. We've, you know, we've had nice little tailwinds from the government, recent budget announcements and all those types of things. And so we certainly feel like, um, you know, it's a great space to be in as well. Uh, we just had a question before regarding Crimson's valuation. So what was the valuation that you went in at last round? Uh, it was about 10 times revenue. Um, I'm not sure I could disclose the actual valuation number. I think I might be on the CA in that. But look, circa 10 times uh, last 12 month revenue is about the metric for a company growing at that rate with the market opportunity with the team. I consider that to be a very fair valuation. Sure. I think before you mentioned that revenue was roughly 50 million. Correct. Um, yeah. so, okay. you can, you're good it's at math, right? Yeah. 10, 10, 10 times five. There you go. Okay. 10 times 50. Thereabouts. Thereabouts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Half a billion. Yep. And, and Martin, do you want to maybe just, just uh, give a little bit of a, you know, sort of um, insight into the next opportunity that you're, you're leading on without probably giving too much away? But... Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll probably give too much away. So, um, um, so if I can ask for reasonable confidentiality on this, because we're in a we're 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 in a, uh, a confirmatory due diligence on a yeah. on another asset that we're the lead investor on, and we have a term sheet that is executed, and we're about three weeks away from completion. So this is another education business. It's an education technology business. It's an Australian business. Um, it actually, and and by the way, I'll describe it. Any of you in this market will probably identify it, but I'll, but I won't name it for for reasons of protecting and respecting the confidentiality. Um, the company is effectively um, a company that provides credit facilities for parents of high school students. So simplest way to describe it, that for any of you who've got um, kids at private school, let's just say the average school fees at the moment, circa $36,000 or certainly uh, mine were uh, last year, um, pay that typically over three semesters or four semesters. But if that school was to offer you the ability to pay that monthly, with no interest charge. So effectively it's buy now, pay later. You're paying the same uh, cost of education, but you're paying that in 12 installments. You're probably gonna take that um, as a means of just smoothing out your cash flows. For the school though, that provides material benefits in receivables, in administration, in certainly around cash flow. And for the provider, which is the company that we're um, about to lead their series B round in, um, they're able to deploy that capital. They pay the school per semester. So their debt facility, which is a warehouse facility, effectively allows them to deploy the capital multiple times in a year. And they do that for a fee that they charge the school on. So it's a, like a merchant pays fee. That's why it's similar to Afterpay in that respect. And um, that generates a really high return on equity. So it's, it's, it's still an emerging company. It's probably on the small end of our revenue profile that Martin talked about earlier. It's very much on the small end, it's lower than that. Uh, but it's a company that we think has got a, a terrifically interesting business model, really good register, um, excellent management team and, and terrific prospects in terms of growing. So again, we are uh, pretty delighted to be in the frame. We are in confirmatory DD, uh, we haven't uh, completed that yet. So it, it's absolutely not certain that we'll complete, although it's you know, like all these things, when you get to this stage, you, you know, you, you go in with high degree of confidence. So that's is, is that just targeted at your relatively, I guess, high fee paying private schools? Yeah. So no, typically, I mean, just give you an idea. There's about 1.4 million private school students in Australia. Um, and, you know, obviously the range of fees varies from the top end schools, the Sydney grammars, Melbourne grammars, et cetera, to the Catholic schools, which are, uh, you know, materially lower fees, as all of you would know. On this call, so let's just say on average, it's probably about twenty to twenty-five thousand across 
the entire base of, of opportunity. Um, and, you know, if you've got three kids at school and you've got three lost school fees, and let's just say, you know, I had two, fortunately I only had two. Um, if I had three, you know, hundred grand a year, then, the, you know, that's a material outlay. And people pay that because they choose to. And education is pretty fundamental to most people. It's one, one of the interesting points is the credit risk here is very low because ultimately people won't take their kids out of school. They'll pay their fees, right? The last thing they'll do is take their kids out of their school environment if they're particularly happy with that. Right. So uh, really low credit defaults. Um, so it's a very successful credit business, which these have to be as, as, um, as a credit business. So, um, yeah, look, I think, I think, you know, the world of, um, of education fees and, and that extends, I mean, they're high school K to 12 at the moment, but I'll look at the other point to make is on average people, the average lifespan of a customer on this particular platform is seven years. Uh, because once you do it one year, you keep going all the way through the year 12 in effect, right? So, but there are opportunities to extend this into other geographies and there's opportunities to extend this into other adjacencies, um, particularly, um, uh, tertiary qualifications that are um, assisted by HEX or fee help. And your top private schools don't have a problem in offering that type of product? Yeah, look, some of them offer it themselves, but they offer it as their own kind of uh, yeah. uh, payment plan. Um, it doesn't actually relieve them of the administrative burden. They still have to deal with a thousand parents and they still got to collect and they still got to handle, you know, all that risk versus handing it over to a provider who does that, who gives you a check at the beginning of the semester a thousand times, 12,000. Or whatever it might be mm. so you've got certainly a cash flow much lower administrative burden you don't have to worry about handling a thousand parent inquiries so there's a really material roi to the school in that administrative administrative effort now the big schools with two thousand kids um probably at a point where they can afford to have a team of four or five people just doing that right so mm. the, the the sweet spot at the moment on this particular company are schools that are more like the 500 to 1200 type range. Sure. Um, but I think over time that will grow. It's still very nice. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And, and I think the, the, uh, the next investment, again, we talked about on the call last time, it's um, the, the health insurance business focused on yeah. preventable injury workplace, um, you know, cover and injuries and things like that. It's an $80 billion a year market in Australia alone. Um, you know, one of our partners um, has, is, is worked with and has been an associate of the founder for the last 20 years. So it's a very strong relationship. We've been working with them for now, probably nine, 12 months. Um, the business has grown materially since we last talked um, and uh, we're now at the stage of getting that deal signed up. So we are very excited about that one. That one also has global um, global opportunity. You know, we've helped them sign up the, the leading four or five insurers in Australia. And, um, and obviously they're all part of an international insurance group. And so the international group is saying, well, if this continues to work in Australia, then we'll look to take this business offshore. So in that business, we have, um, you know, negotiated in large follow on rights um, into both the Australian opportunity and the global opportunity as well. So um, that's one we're excited about. So as I mentioned, by a second close, um, 30, let's call it 30 September, um, you know, we will have announced those um, seven investments, um, including most likely the Edge follow-on investment. Um, and at that stage, we would have invested 70 of the $90 million and, um, you know, really feel like we're good to go from a portfolio perspective. Maybe room for one more. Great. And just to confirm everyone on the call, you're saying that sort of 130 hard ceiling, that's just down the difference between the 130 and the 90 is really going to be for, for follow-up follow investments in the existing portfolio. Yeah, look, I mean, that's sort of, I suppose, you know, where we think we'd like to get to. Um, and yep. as I said, yeah, but with line of sight to, you know, the capital required for some of these portfolio and investments and the visibility over those businesses, we feel like that's, you know, the right amount of capital that we need to see them all the way through. The last thing we want to do is, um, you know, end up getting diluted in subsequent yeah. rounds and, and miss out on that sort of value creation as we continue to see it through to the end of the journey. Okay. And just on for investors that have already committed, the investors that are looking to come in, um, I think um, the, one of the most recent announcements you were looking to first call of sort of 50 to 60 percent. Um, I guess that'd be in the next few weeks now. What does that sort of drawdown profile um, won't hold you to? It. What's that drawdown profile look like at the moment? Yeah, so so we can um, so I think the, the drawdown schedule is really dependent on this follow on opportunity to edge, which as I said, we've now got a handshake on about to, about to ink the term sheet. Um, and then there's probably 
you know, we're still working at the timing three to five, three to five weeks for completion to happen. Um, so, you know, assuming that completion happens before second close, then we expect a sort of 50 to 60% drawdown for our existing ordinary capital investors. So that's the first drawdown from, from their perspective. Um, and then we would expect that, you know, we'll be fully deployed, fully drawn down um, within probably nine to 12 months from here, you know, maybe a little bit longer, but, you know, large, by and large, the majority of, of the um, the capital would be deployed in that time time frame weeks. Okay, by, so by this time next year, you're yeah, almost fully drawn. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Um, probably covers it from my side, guys, unless there's any other points you feel like I've, I've missed or anything else you'd like to, to mention. If there's any um, questions from the audience, I might give them a couple of minutes. But yeah, if there's anything else you feel it's worth noting at this time. I think I'm good from my perspective. Oh, no, thank you for the opportunity. I, you know, my, the key point, and, and I just want to emphasize one point, we're not, and because you ask questions around concentration of the portfolio, we're not venture capital high risk, um, you know, uh, uh, portfolio managers here. So, you know, the businesses we're investing in are all proven mm -hmm. and have revenue traction, quite material revenue traction. We do see a lot of deal flow on the latest gadget, wearable, treatment plan, whatever, right? We, we see all that. We actually take all those meetings and we, because we learn from that and we're, we're, you know, we're getting a, a deeper appreciation, but we are focused on portfolio companies that are demonstrating large markets, terrific teams, proven revenue traction. So this is true growth equity, scale up capital on that. And that's a little bit different from early stage. So that requires a more concentrated portfolio and you, you know, you, you follow in your winners re really strongly, which is what we're doing. Yeah, and I think yeah sure. Yeah. We invest in, in businesses, not products, you know, I think yeah. that's the key thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting approach as well because I think, you know, many investors out there when they go into funds, when there's additional capital available, it always tends to be I've found for newer opportunities because you're identifying these businesses and almost saying we know we're going to be paying at a high valuation for them in the future, but we can just see that, I guess, that growth trajectory and we're comfortable with that. Yep. Yeah, it's a very, it's, it's, it's new approach, but actually makes a lot of sense. So, yep, um, that's Probably it from our side, guys. I really appreciate your time again, and um, you know, congratulations on what you built so far. I'm continuing to follow the story. Oh, that is actually one question I had, and, and um, you mentioned this last time, Martin. But just when there is actually a realization in the portfolio. So, for example, um, yeah, if Crimson did um, list in two years' time on the Nasdaq, and there's a liquidity event, do you just want to explain to um, investors what then happens to, to their investment in the, in the fund? Yeah. So, um, you know. By and large, we each, for each exit, we return the money at that stage. Um, yep. you know, our best guidance is that we'll start looking for liquidity events between year three, four, and five. If yep. we're on a, on a great long-term winner, uh, we may hold it for longer, but kind of that's the best sort of guidance that we could give. Yep. Um, you know, there is you know a, a small chance that you know there might be one opportunity that we may exit earlier than that, where mm -hmm. we see the valuation sort of getting away from us, and you know, on the one hand, be like we don't really want to top up at that level. And in fact, if we're sitting on a good return now, let's take the money off the table. And, and there might be one example of, of that. There, if, and if that happens, say, in the next six months, it, it might be before we're fully drawn on the fund. So we have a, we have a small right to reinvest sort of um, 20%. In that case, we might reinvest it. But other, other than that, you know, it's, uh, it's return the money um, and move on. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. Well, Martin Dalglish, Martin Robinson, appreciate your time again, guys, today. And um, we'll send a, a recording this around to all in attendees. And if there's some... Um, if there's any further questions, we'll be sure to send them through. Great. And thanks for the support, everyone. Thank you, everyone. All the best. Bye-bye. Take care.